Right. So last week uh, I passed a milestone. Um, 300 people have apparently accidentally uh, clicked the subscribe button on my channel. So as a uh, as a bonus, here's a here's a bit of a moan. Bah. It's a video about Ocean Gate, or rather about the lot of bollocks that's being spouted about Ocean Gate and the Titan implosion, and most of which is being done in a very venal search for click revenue. Uh, disaster for me. Now, I've watched quite a few of these videos, and if I can see that they're bollocks, oh, I working. Yes, they are. Uh, if I can see they're bollocks, it's pretty fucking low grade. I'm not a submariner. Material scientist, but I can do maths, and yeah, I know a few things about physics and materials. Now, I'm not talking about people who are doing serious videos on this. Hello, um, wait a second. Um, people doing serious videos like on this, um, such as Thunderfoot, whose video I don't agree with, but is relatively sensible. Uh, Scott Manley, who did a very good. Uh, stream on it, and um, Dirty Garage guy, Matt, who used to be in the workshop, who did another very good video on this. But these are people who do engineering type videos, and you know, that's, um, that's what you'd expect. No, this is people who are just you know, putting out videos just obviously to get uh, to get the good Google clicks. So, there's a few things that they all seem to be coming out with, and it's all bollocks. So the first one is... Oh my god, they glued the end caps on. How's that supposed to work? It's obviously going to leak. Um, but the people who are saying this haven't looked at the videos that we have available and don't know how forces work. Possibly both. Um, yes, it was a carbon fibre tube. Yes, it was glued to titanium rings, which were bolted to the hemispherical titanium end caps. We know that. And as per the Ocean Gate site, before the, uh, before the thing, which you know, a lot of the stuff's been taken off, but you know, we've, still, we've still got the dimensions. The dimensions of that carbon tube were 2.5 metres long, 2.54, 1.68 metres diameter, which I think is the exterior diameter, but it doesn't make a great deal, a great deal of odds one way or the other, or 0.84 metres in radius. And the carbon fibre was 127 millimetres thick. All of the force that's applied to the end caps in, a, in an axial sense, you know, you do your basic, uh, basic secondary school you know, vector, you know, splitting your vectors into two, into two, two angles. Uh, all of the stuff that's happening in the axial sense must, according to the design, be transmitted through those glue joints. There's nothing in between. It's got to go down, down the skin. Um, and the force that's being applied is twice the force that's being applied to one end cap in the axial sense and the force that's being applied to one end cap is pi times r squared which is you know, the area of the circle um, multiplied by the pressure because pressure is force divided by area so if you get uh, force divided by area multiply it by area you get the force um, and that force is then going to be spread over the area of the glued joint. Now, the area of the glued joint is smaller than the area of the end cap. It is, in fact, pi times r squared less pi times r minus the thickness of the carbon squared. Now, you take, you know, take, two, take your two circles, take one away from the other, and that's what's left. Um, and if you take the force that's being applied and divide it by the area of the glue joint, you get the pressure that's being applied to the glue joint. So, concrete example, Titan is assumed to have imploded about 3,300 metres of depth. And the pressure at that, uh, at that depth is about 33,000 kilopascals, or 33 megapascals. Now, one pascal is one newton, applied over one square metre. These are proper units, right? because you know, this is engineering. Um, so the force that's being applied to the glue joint is 2 times pi times r squared, multiplied by 33 million, 
which gets you 146 mega newtons. That's quite a lot. Um, it's getting on for about 15,000 metric tons of force, which is all a bit squeezy. Now, that force is being applied over an area of about 0.62 meters squared, which means that the glue joints are seeing a pressure of about 235,000 kilopascals, which is an order of magnitude more than the 33,000 kilopascals that the exterior, the exterior of the thing is seeing. So that's being squashed together quite hard. So even if the glue joint is failing, um, it, you know, it might have a little crack in it or something, water is not going through it because it's being squashed together so fucking hard that the glue is going to deform and there won't be any cracks left. So unless there's actually a lump that's dropped out, um, no water's getting in there. And lumps aren't dropping out because the carbon goes into the titanium ring like that, it's completely constrained. And the stuff that's at the end here, that's, that's not falling out. So, what's the glue there for? Um, now, there's two reasons, pretty much. The first one, it's very simple, is to stop the ends of the submarine from simply falling off. Yeah, when it's not underwater, when you put it in the water, it goes down, goes down. Not good. Um, and the second one is actually to fill the voids that you get between the titanium ring and the carbon tube. Now, these are two machine surfaces, but machine surfaces are never perfect. Um, and while the forces that we're talking about will deform stuff, voids and high points will create pressure concentrations and pressure concentrations mean instant delamination pretty much. Um, so you put the glue in there and that fills all the voids and you've just got something that's pretty much solid and, and, and you, you, you guarantee that the area you're applying that force over is, is the area that you wanted. Now, there is some video evidence um, of gluing the end caps on. <coughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Um, that uh, video evidence is, I believe, of the first hull, the one that they scrapped after it started making lots and lots of horrible noises on its first dive. Um, so, looking at that evidence and assuming that they didn't change their techniques, um, you can see that they're mixing the glue by hand, not the best way to do it, applying it by hand, they don't seem to be degassing it, although they could have done, um, and there doesn't seem to be any squeeze out on the glue, which might mean that there's not enough. And that could be why the first hull made horrible noises, you know, it could, it could be that they didn't put enough glue in there, but who knows. Um, it's potentially pretty shoddy. Um, doesn't seem to be to have been done in any sort of clean room. You know, there's nothing. Nobody wearing wearing naughty suits and, and hairnets and shit like that. There's a bloke, you know, wiping a piece of titanium with a dirty rag and he's, you know, putting his hands on it. Um, yeah. Um, but talking about how they did it is is pure speculation. If you're basing it on that particular video, um, and the only thing you can really say is that they almost certainly should have autoclaved it. Um, they didn't autoclave it, we know that. They didn't autoclave either of them. Um, now, if the glue had been a real issue, I think um, it would have been a one dive and you're done thing. You, know, you get down to, down to depth, the whole thing starts to delaminate, bim bom, bim bam, and you don't come back up again. Um, now, there's another load of steaming wank that, uh, that comes in, and that's carbon doesn't bend. Carbon doesn't flex, it shatters. Well, that's absolute bollocks. Carbon can and does bend. Pretty much anything bends if you force it enough. Um, it's very stiff, but it bends. You can use a carbon fiber fishing rod and, you know, it bends quite a lot. It bends all the way up to its elastic limit and then it goes snap. And yes, it does go snap. Um, its failure is drastic and shattering. It's glass. It's a glass failure. Um, yeah, hell, but we do make springs from carbon fibre even, so, you know, hey. Um, 
carbon fibre has an almost negligible plastic deformation zone. Um, so yeah, it, it just explodes once you get past the past the elastic limit. So would using another another material have saved the people on the Titan? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, if their design is going up to the elastic limit, then definitely not. Um, now I'm going to say that you know they, they weren't completely stupid. They almost certainly weren't designing up to the elastic limit, at least not deliberately. Um, but if you design up to the elastic limit, you know, your steel. Uh, what you need to look at is a graph of uh, stress and strain for the materials. So if you look at one for carbon fibre, it goes up like that, straight line, and share, that's your elastic zone, and then bit drops off the cliff. That's uh, that's where it fails. And if you look at the steel or titanium. You know, and that's your elastic zone, and then it goes pretty much horizontal, and then it goes off a cliff. And so you've got the elastic zone, plastic deformation, failure. And that more or less horizontal, sort of horizontal-ish bit, is where the material is deforming permanently. And if it's basically horizontal, what that means is that it's bending and you're not putting more force onto it. So you, know, you take it up to X X newtons of force, and then it just keeps going until it snaps. Um, so you know, you see, you've seen the videos of, uh, of you know, a train train carriage doing uh, doing an implosion, a you know, steam implosion, where they boil the water off, and the whole thing like that. Um, the uh, if they if they'd made the thing from steel, and it had gone up to the elastic limit for steel, then that is what would have happened to Titan. Okay, the train carriage thing, um, that's under one atmosphere. We're under 300 or so atmospheres, so it might have been slightly more violent. Um, it probably would have squeezed the occupants out of the porthole at the end, like uh, like toothpaste out of a tube. There you go. But otherwise, yeah, there's no there's no, no particular difference for the people who are inside. You know, you're dead, you're dead. Now, Dirty Carriage Guy did a very good video um, where he roughly modelled um, the submarine, um, according to the dimensions that we had available, um, did it in SolidWorks, I think, uh, and then ran some uh, ran some CFD stuff over it and and looked at where the forces were where were being concentrated. And force concentrations are surprisingly enough all the way around the end of the, the carbon tube where it joins where it joins the titanium. Now yeah, it goes into a groove like that. Um, so on the inside, so that's the inside, um, the carbon can't be pushed in because otherwise you know, if, if the, the force of water would just bend it in and then it'd snap. So it needs to be constrained there and the top end is well, constraining it but it's not actually doing anything. Uh, that top lip is just stop, stopping water getting into the glue joint as far as I can tell. Um, now the fact that the titanium isn't bending as much as the carbon means that the carbon is starting off like that and as pressure hits it, it bends like this. And this is where you start getting into problems with, uh, with carbon fibre because you are repeatedly stressing and straining this thing, you're bending it like this around, around this, this sharp edge. Um, and as you bend and unbend and bend and unbend, eventually um, fibres within the matrix are breaking um, and the elastic limit of the material is going down. Until you actually get to the point where the only thing that's left, pretty much, is the glue, the, the binder for the, for the, for the composite. Um, you're probably not getting anywhere near that before, before a, a utter failure. But yeah, repeated stress cycles will take the elastic limit of your carbon fibre down and you know, if you've got stress concentrations it's just going to it's it's get worse. So, yeah, all of those things are happening on the edge and uh, you know, it's, it's all going to let go in a big way. So, anybody saying carbon doesn't bend is a twat. Carbon does bend. Um, so, you know, the people, people who are saying that have got less of a clue than I have. Um, also, you should probably take note of the fact that people who are saying that carbon fibre is a new material are wankers as well and they've got no fucking clue either. Um, there was something else that came to my mind there. What the hell was it? Um, uh, I it was bending, but I, I 
forget. Anyway, um, so there's another big glaring pile of camel smegma that's being churned out, which is uh, using the video footage of that first hull being being made and extrapolating from that that Titan only had hoop-wound carbon. Now that video does show the hoop winding process. It doesn't show the axial layup. Um, the, the Titan was made with uh, alternating layers of hoop wound carbon and then axially, axially put in pre -preg. Um That is you know, a fairly, fairly reasonable way of making stuff apart from the fact that they're, you know, they're doing wet, wear, wet layup on the, uh, on the hoop wound stuff. Um, apart from the fact that they didn't autoclave it. But even without autoclaving it, they got a pretty good result. Um, less than 1% of uh, porosity, I think, was the, the number that they came out with. Um, so for anybody saying that they didn't do non-destructive testing, well, bollocks to that as well, because they clearly did do some. They might not have done any after the dives, but at least when they made the thing, there were inspections. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't Ocean Gate making it, it was another you know, a, a carbon fiber specialist who made the tubes. Um, anyway, this whole thing about hoop wound carbon is utter shite. Um, so if anybody is coming out with that shit, despite the fact that it's been pointed out to them, um, and there's a couple of people I can think of who've done that, um, they are just, you know, disaster farmers, and they can be discounted as utter country bulls. Um, and then, yes, there's the transcript. Um, the less that we say about that, the better. Um, if it was real, we assume that it was real, um, it would have been released because it gave us new information. It didn't give us any new information, it gave us some stuff that you could probably speculate on. Um, if it was real or realistic, then people who know far better than me would have you know, said so. You'd have had James Cameron saying, well, yeah, okay, that, look, that looks like it was real. So, yeah, that's all bollocks, I reckon. And, you know, the internet is full of cunts who are, who are quite happy to, to put out untrue stuff around any disaster. Disaster farmers now? Wankers. Absolute wankers. Fuck them all. What we should do is make a giant replica of the Titan, stuff, stuff them in it, make it from you know, second-rate, only hoop-wound carbon, stuff it in it, stuff them in it, fuck it off into the Marianas Trench. Shot the fucking lot of them. Anyway, so there you go. Oh, and uh, yes, on, um, on another note, a much more positive note, um, when I blew up my variator, my VFD, and the uh, the motor went out with it on the lathe, um, I did actually buy another VFD. Um, I haven't fitted it yet, it's sat under my desk. Um, I contacted the manufacturers, um, who are Chinese, and lots of people shit on the Chinese and say yeah, they can't make good stuff, and you know, they've got no, no support and the rest of it. They have sent me a repair kit for my VFD, um, pretty much free of charge. It contains basically the guts of the of the VFD. Um, their technical and customer support people are fantastic. So, if you're looking to buy a VFD, get you one of these. They're made by Inflixin. I don't know if you can see that. Let's have a look. Can we see that? Yeah, that's the name of them. They've got a couple of stores on AliExpress. They're cheap. I mean, yeah, they are basically a throwaway device, but uh, they seem to do the job, and they're, and they're actually more uh, more advanced in terms of their, their firmware than most of the other ones that I've come across, including big names, uh, big name European manufacturers. So yeah, Inflixin, good lads. Anyway, bye.